Father, just thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with everything at any time and know that you hear, Lord. Uh, Father, we can't be there to help, uh, but Lord, we know that you're ever present. Uh, you're omnipresent. You're everywhere, helping, ministering, encouraging, strengthening your people, Lord. And we do pray for Jeff and Lynn tonight, Lord, that you'd be with them, that you'd strengthen them, that you'd just give them understanding for the times that they're in, Lord. They've never been at this place before, Lord. They need your leading. They need your comfort. They need your strength, Lord. So just ask that you'd minister to them. Just encourage them. Have your way with them. And Father, pray that you'd be with us, that you'd just open your word to our hearts and our minds, uh, that we would just see all that you have for us tonight, Lord. And just thank you for leaving us your word. What a precious gift, Lord, that you've given us. Uh, a precious, precious book with precious promises, with great encouragement, with words of chastisement at times, Lord, uh, but always meant to encourage us and strengthen us in our walk with you. So help us in those things, Lord, to receive all that you have for us. And we just give you thanks for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you would, Mark chapter 6, as we pick up in there, may not get through the whole chapter, but we'll get through whatever we can here uh, but he starts out and, and again remember mark is is just uh, uh blazing this trail through here quickly <clears throat> uh, some of his uh, favorite words i guess you could say is immediately and straightway he just goes quickly through these things as he writes these down as the holy spirit gives him uh, wisdom and understanding in it uh, it says in verse 1, and he went out from thence, and he came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. Uh, so he's going back to Nazareth. Probably the last time he goes back to Nazareth uh, is here now. Uh, he's going back home, uh, going through the area, ministering there. Uh, and remember, so many have said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And uh, <laughs> uh, we, we know Jesus did, so uh, we know something good came out of Nazareth. Uh, but he went out from where he was, comes to his own country for a purpose, for a reason. Uh, and I think it's probably more for the disciples <clears throat> and for his own family than for uh, a lot of the other folks. Uh, but... Uh, he always works, so uh, we just look at this in amazement of what God will do. Uh, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things, and what wisdom is this that is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? So they're astonished. Uh, they're, they're amazed at what he's done. They're, they stand in awe at the wisdom he has, at the understanding of Scripture that he has, and yet at the same time they're resistant to what he's saying because they know him and they, they, they can't believe that, that he has all this understanding without going to school, with, without having training from uh, the rabbis that, that were there in, in around and teaching younger rabbis uh, the traditions of men. Uh, he doesn't bring any of those things out. He, he just brings out the word and gives out the word. Uh, and for you and I, that, that is such an important thing that we would stay in the word, that we would be in the word. And if you're coming here to church, we're going to be in the Word, so uh, uh, we're not going to some of the other things that are popping up all around uh, the world and the country. Uh, we just want the Word to come out because the Word brings life. Uh, and if we want life in us, then we need to be in the Word. So stay in the Word, get up in the morning, get in the Word, but just have the Word before you and walk with the living Word. It's life. It brings life. Uh, but they look at him, they're astonished, they're amazed that, that he can have the wisdom and the understanding that he does. But then they say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? <laughs> they don't even look at him as a rabbi, as a teacher. Uh, they're just amazed at the wisdom he has. Uh, and, and he's got mighty works. They've heard of the mighty works. Remember, the first time he went into the synagogue, uh, a demon was waiting there for him <laughs> in church, of course, uh, just just to cause trouble for him. Uh, 
Uh, but just uh, amazing that the, the enemy knows where he's going and what he's doing, uh, but the people of God can't seem to grab a hold of it. They're too familiar with this man. And sometimes we look at that in our own families. Uh, our own families look at us and, and go, really? You got saved? You're born again? There's a fad. We'll give you six months, and, and then we know that things will change from there. Uh, and they look at us, and, and yet we continue in it because it's real. It's true. Uh, and the longer we continue in it, sometimes the more resistant they become to us because they just don't want to hear those things that would convict their hearts, that would tell them that there's an eternity waiting for them, uh, and it's either heaven or hell. But they look at Jesus, uh, and they really bring a big insult to him. Uh, they're, they're, they're more insulting to him than some of the other places that he's visited. They call him rabbi there. They call him teacher there. But here they say he's a carpenter, and he's the son of Mary, which is the super biggest insult that could come because every man has his genealogy from his father. And they look at him and say, isn't this the son of Mary? Because remember, they think he's illegitimate. So there's, what they're saying to him is, we don't know who your father is. A real insult to this man, to our Jesus. And it amazes me that Jesus just doesn't smoke people on the spot sometimes. <laughs> Because our tendency is that we, our anger would rise up, our pride would rise up, and we would. We would just smoke them. We'd give them what for, if we knew what what for was. But most of the time, we can't come up with anything, so we just let it slide and pray for them. Lord, take care of them. <laughs> but, but they come, they say, isn't this the son of Mary? But notice, too, for those of you brought up in a certain faith, he's the brother of James and Joses and of Judah and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. So the rest of the family, the other children of Mary and Joseph are there. Uh, and they were offended at him. They were astonished and offended. How do you do that? They're astonished at his words. They, they know he's done mighty works, he's done miracles, but they're offended at him. And yet, don't we see it in the church today? Hmm. It's a lot of people that if you bring out the word, they get offended. A lot of places that, that just control what the pastor can say and what he can't say. Remember one church that we came out of, uh, they had a contract for the pastor. He was called by the church, he was run by the church. And he had to sign the contract or else not be able to teach by the church. You can teach 20 minutes. Wouldn't you love that part? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you can teach for 20 minutes, but don't talk too much about sin. Don't talk too much about the blood. Just keep it low key because we want people in the seats. Really? Aren't you glad Jesus is different? Aren't you glad that we can give out the words of life, the whole counsel of God, and not just give out certain parts that, that suit us at the moment? So they're offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Just looking at his brothers and sisters, <laughs> and just a prophet. He called himself a prophet there. A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and from his own kin. He looks at them and he said, I'm that prophet that was talked about in Deuteronomy 18 that was going to give out the words that God the Father gave him. And he said, my meat is to always do the will of my Father. I, I'm here to proclaim the words that my Father has given me. Uh, and yet, they didn't say anything about that. They're going to remember it later and they're going to come to it and praise the Lord some of these uh, of his brothers and sisters got saved later that we know of. James, of course, wrote the book of James, and he was probably the, the pastor at the church of Jerusalem when Paul came through, uh, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, but he says, a, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. He, he's going through the same things that some of the other prophets went through. And some of the other prophets were sawn asunder, cut in pieces, burned, killed, by the people who were supposed to adore them and reverence their position from God. And yet God continues to allow them to go on. We can do it with words. We can do it with actions. Uh, but boy, uh, I, I would hate to stand before the Lord in the end times and to hear the accusations against us. Can you imagine having to cringe 
under the reality that you're standing before the one that you blasphemed all your life. And he's the judge over you. And so in verse 5, he goes on, he says, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. He was able, but we weren't willing to let him work. And we certainly have to watch that in our own lives. He's able to do everything in our lives if we allow him. But he won't do anything against our will. He won't do anything that, that comes against what we want. And sometimes we restrict him. We grieve the Holy Spirit. We resist. We quench what he wants to do uh, because we just don't want God to work in our lives. We've got our agenda. We've got our own plan. We've got our own way. And we're going to do what, what we want sometimes. And yet we'll stand in church on Sunday and we'll raise our hands and we'll praise the Lord. And the Lord will go, really, and try and show us what's really in our hearts. We think we're okay. And a lot of America thinks that they're okay. We're okay. We're going to heaven. We got baptized as kids. We went to church once. We should be okay with God because our good works outweigh our bad. I haven't, I haven't killed anybody lately. Mm. But the trouble is uh, we, that account that we have before the Lord, the list keeps growing instead of being short. We, we need to keep that list short with the Lord. Father, what have I done with you today? And what do you have to say to me as I come to you tonight, Lord, what 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 do you have to say to me? Where, where's my heart? Where's my ways? Am I okay with you? And he marveled <laughs> because of their unbelief. Uh, it, it's amazing to us, uh, but back in, in Matthew, uh, he, he says this <laughs> in chapter 8, verse 10. He, he's there with, with the centurion. The centurion has called him uh, because... Uh, his servant is sick uh, and he's tormented, it says. Uh, he's on the point of death. Uh, and Jesus entered into Capernaum. Came, uh, in, there came unto him the centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, and he's grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. He isn't even a good Jew. He's a centurion. He's a Gentile. And Jesus said, I don't have any qualms because he isn't a Jew. I'll come and heal him because I know your heart is for this man. And the centurion said, answered him and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goeth and another come and he comes. And, and to my servant, he said, I say, do this and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. The same word, he marveled. He marveled at the Jews because of their unbelief. He marveled at this Gentile because of his belief. <laughs> Amazing. Elijah had the same thing going. Uh, it talks about it in Scripture, that when Elijah was on earth and ministering, that the, the captain uh, of the army, the Syrian army, Naaman, uh, came to get healed by Elijah because there was no prophet in his own country that could heal him. And the little maid that was a servant girl of, of his said, boy, I wish you could meet Elijah because he'd heal you. <laughs> and he comes and Elijah heals him. And, and Naaman proclaims great glory for this man because he could. But it tells us in Scripture that the, the times that Jesus marveled at unbelief, he was talking about the Jews and yet a Gentile woman who came and said, uh, can I have some of the crumbs that fall from your table? She was a Gentile, and she entered in by faith. Naaman, who was the uh, captain of the army of the enemies of the Jews, was healed. And Jesus says that he marveled at the faith of the centurion. Amazing that the unbelievers could have more faith and trust than the believers. And, and it really makes me stop when I read this portion of Scripture and look at my own heart and go, Lord, am I marveling you with my unbelief at what you can do in my life? Am I marveling at what you can do in, in other people's lives that aren't believers? And yet I'm not willing for you to do the same thing in my life. Do I have faith to trust you? Do I even want to trust you with the situations that, that I'm in? 
or do I have my plan all set up and I'm all okay to go? And sometimes we hold things against the Lord just because we want our way and we have our plan and we look at things differently than what God looks at them. We should never come to the Lord with our agenda and say, Lord, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the plan. What do you think? Because I'm going ahead with this. <laughs> and he goes, well, you can go ahead with it, but I'm not in it. Oh. And yet we think, Lord, what, why haven't you blessed it? I gave it to you. It was a good plan, Lord. And he goes, yeah, it was a good plan, but it wasn't mine. <laughs> that was a plan for somebody else. And I really have to check my own heart. Lord, are you marveling at my unbelief? Or are you marveling because I have faith to trust you in spite of what things look like? We trust him with our salvation, but there's times when we don't trust him with faith for him to work in our lives the way that he wants to. Because we have a, a picture of what he's going to do. And he says, that's not in my plan at all. I, I don't even have that series of pictures in my camera. <laughs> I, I got a whole different thing going for you. Really? Yeah. I got cancer in your future? Really? Lord, that's not in my plan. He goes, I know. <laughs> it's coming anyway. What are you going to do with it? Oh, and we get amazed. We, get, we marvel. And yet he marvels at our unbelief. Can't you trust me? If you can trust me with your salvation, can't you trust me with what's going on in your life today? Mm. And that's hard for us sometimes because it just doesn't go along with what we think looks good. <laughs> so he calls unto him the twelve. <laughs> uh, after Jesus leaves uh, Nazareth and, and goes out, he calls unto him the, the twelve. That should be a movie or something, the twelve. He calls unto him the twelve and began to send them out to for, uh, send them forth two by two and gave them. Notice he gives them the power over unclean spirits. They don't have it just because they're his disciples. They don't have it like a lot of people believe. Once I have him, I can I can do anything. I can come against Satan. I can do anything. But if we don't have the power that God gives us, we don't have power over anything. It's the power that He gives us. Not the power that we have because we're Christians now. We ha we have a, a thing in front of our name that says Christian or St. Billy or whatever that we can do these things. He gives them that power to us over unclean spirits. And he commanded them. Uh, he commands them to do uh, the things that he has for them. And this is what he commands them. And, and this is really amazing to me because it goes against all the big churches and and. TBN right now, he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save, save a staff only, no script, which was a, a beggar's bag uh, that people would fill up for their journey from people who would give them, a, donate money to them. It was a beggar's bag. Uh, and he says, in ministry, there is no beggar's bag that you take with you. Hmm. Oops, Channel 50 just went, went off the station. It's amazing, isn't it? He said, I want you to take a staff, no, no beggar's bag, don't take any bread, don't take any money in your purse. Really? Lord, how many missionaries would go <laughs> if this was the case? We know of a few Hudson Taylors and a few others that went with absolutely nothing, not even backing, and yet not very many. Well, we got to work up our support before we can go anywhere. Folks, if God has called you to something... He's called you to go now. He hasn't called you to go after you work up what you think you need. This is how much money I need. And once I hit 75%, then I'm pretty much there. And I can pretty much get ready to go. Really? Does that mean God didn't really call? And that's strange, isn't it? It's a strange thing for us. That when God calls us, he calls us without anything. And what he's really showing us is, I'm going to give you the power I'm going to give you everything that you need. I'm going to give you power over unclean spirits. I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you provision. I'm going to be the one to take you. And yet, what is one of the biggest complaints in churches today? I don't have enough money because God's not providing, so I've got to do something else. If God has called us to walk with him and he's going to take care of us, do we really trust him in it? Oh. And you know, some of the sweetest times are those times when God takes care of us completely. 
I remember when I first showed up at church at, at Calvary, Rochester. <laughs> I, I just quit my job at Wegmans because the Lord told me to. He could have done it a year sooner, but instead he said, this is going to be the worst year of your life at Wegmans. And it was. It was an awful year. Kathy even stopped praying for me. Because she said, every time I pray for you, it gets worse. I'm not praying for you anymore. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't see you go through this. It was just an awful year. And then at the end of the year, he goes, okay, it's time to quit. Really? And then what do I do? He says, just quit. So I quit. 22 years. And I quit. Go to church. I said, I'm supposed to be here. And Jeff looks at me and he goes, okay, but we haven't got an income for you. And he goes, I know. I'm not asking for an income. And it was there a year before they started paying me. Because God provided. He took care of us. Every single bill got paid. I have no clue how. He knows how. But he takes care of those things. And he does those things. If we're faithful to step out and to do those things that he's called us to do. Sometimes there's, they're big things. Sometimes they're little things. But he wants the same obedience in everything. Not just in the big ones. He wants obedience in the little ones, too. Mm. And sometimes it's easier for us to do the big things, isn't it, than to do the little things. He calls the 12. And he says, guys, I got a great trip for you. Take a, take a staff, and that's it. And get going. And only take one coat, too, by the way. Because two coats were, if it was cold at night, you could have the second coat to put on. He says, no, no, only take one. I'm taking care of everything on this trip for you. you got to have the covering, but don't take the second coat in case you get cold. <laughs> really, Lord? Can you imagine Peter going, okay, Lord, really? <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't jive with what I see of Peter or Thomas. <laughs> Thomas is probably doubting the whole way through. And yet here they go. They go out. No money in their purse. But be shod with sandals. Don't even put good shoes on, but just put sandals on and, and don't put on two coats. And he said to them, In whatsoever place you enter into the house, there abide till you, you depart from that place. In other words, don't upgrade once you get there. If somebody that's got more money in a better house comes up to you and says, You can come to my house and stay because I know this guy doesn't have much room. You're sleeping in a closet right now in a recliner, and that's probably not good for you. You're a disciple of Jesus. You should come to my house. You've got to say, no, I'm supposed to stay here because Jesus told me to. Upgrading is not always in God's plan. We think it is. Bigger, better. Well, Lord, you know I need a four-car garage. I'm really looking at things to explode here, so I really need this four-car garage. No, you could do without a garage at all. Really? <laughs> Lord, don't you know my plan? Yeah, it's not going to be good. In whatsoever place you enter, abide there till you depart from that place because you're supposed to be in ministry doing the things. Because who are we representing? We're representing the Lord. And if he's told us, then we've got to be faithful to what he's told us to do. And whatsoever... Uh, or whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart then depart thence, shake the dust off your feet uh, for a testimony against them. And verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Levels uh, of judgment that would come against the, the people of these certain cities. And we, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and hail coming down upon the city, burning them up, destroying the cities. The cry had come out from the people that were there. God judged the cities and sent down fire and hail to those cities. But he says it's going to be more tolerable for those cities in the day of judgment than for those cities that didn't receive the disciples. Because Jesus had come, the kingdom of God was at hand, and he was coming to them. Remember when, when they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the angels that, that came, the two angels, and they came to Lot's house, and they got Lot out. They got the believers out, and then the fire and hail came, but it was the angels that came. These are the disciples of Jesus because the kingdom of God is there, present now, being established, being instituted, coming together, 
uh, he, and he says it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah because those were angels. These were my representatives here in that city then, but now my disciples who are with me, representing me, have come before you, and you're rejecting them. And he said, if you shake the dust off your feet on those cities because they won't listen to you, it's going to be worse. Can you imagine the people who reject Jesus now and the Holy Spirit's here? And that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is just rejecting Jesus. They rejected the angels. They rejected the message that was coming from them. But Jesus has come with his message now. And they're rejecting that message. And he said it's going to be more tolerable in the judgment day for Sodom and Gomorrah for the people that were there than it is for the people who reject Jesus. Mm. The judgment that's going to come is true. It's real. It's going to come to pass. And so they went out and they preached that men should repent. The first message they preached is repentance. <laughs> it's not, do you want to feel better? Do you want to have a great life? Just come to Jesus and everything will be rosy and wonderful. Uh, you as Christians know <laughs> Christianity, the walk of Christianity is not all roses. It gets hard sometimes. It gets vicious sometimes. But he, the first message is repent from your direction and come God's direction. And they cast out many devils. He, remember, he gave them the power and they used that power to cast out many devils. And they anointed with oil, just speaking of, of the working of the Spirit in their lives. The, the, they anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So all the works that were done were, were done in his name by his power that he gave them. It wasn't something they worked up. It was something that God gave them. But we know that when God is working, the enemy is also working. Look at verse 14. And King Herod, oops, here we are. As soon as God start, starts working, the enemy also starts working. And we know that that's going to take place. We know that that's going to happen. It shouldn't astonish us. It shouldn't cause us to marvel uh, because the enemy is so quick to come in and try and rob what God has given us, what God has given his people. King Herod heard of Jesus, for his name was spread abroad. Notice it says that, that King Herod heard of him. He didn't hear of his disciples. He heard of Jesus. <laughs> That's the name under heaven by which every man must be saved. Not the disciples' names. Not St. Peter or St. Paul or St. John. It's Jesus. There's only one name under heaven by which we must be saved, and it's his name. His name was spread abroad, and he said that, that it was John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. He, he heard of the mighty works. He heard of the things that were going on. And he said, it's got to be John the Baptist that has been risen from the dead. And others said that it was Elias. And others said that it was a prophet or one of the prophets that had been risen from the dead. Isn't it amazing that they can believe that one of these men could be risen from the dead? And yet when it comes to Jesus' resurrection, they don't believe that he could rise from the dead. Well, if you could believe that John the Baptist, who had his head cut off, <laughs> could rise from the dead, and these other prophets that you sawed in half and burned in fires could come back from the dead, why can't you believe that Jesus could rise from the dead? Sometimes our thinking just gets so out of kilter. Well, one man can do it, but not Jesus. Why not Jesus? Because there's something about that name that we have to trust, that we need to trust but when Herod, verse 16, heard therefore, uh, uh, he said, It is John who I beheaded, for he is risen from the dead. For Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold of, upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother, brother Philip's wife. Notice how the Holy Spirit puts it. He's somebody else's wife. She's somebody else's wife. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doesn't say that it was Herod's wife. He said, no, 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 no. It was Philip's wife. But she left him to go marry Herod because she was looking for more power, more influence, more money. She was looking for something more, and he had married her. For John had said to Herod, John didn't hold back. I love John. <laughs> 
when we start doing Sunday mornings, uh, we're going to go to Nehemiah uh, and start there on Sunday mornings because uh, I love Nehemiah. This guy, he took a guy and, and took him out of the chamber and threw him out the door and then threw his stuff out after him. I love Nehemiah. <laughs> If I'm not on the receiving end, I love Nehemiah. <laughs> we got to keep that straight here. Uh, John had said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And it tells us that in Numbers 11, verse 20, uh, um, uh, verse, or Leviticus uh, 21. I'm sorry, Leviticus 20, 21. We'll get there yet. Uh, he says this, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. It's an abomination. It's something that's unclean that shouldn't be touched, shouldn't be approached, shouldn't be uh, even thought of. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it's an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness, and they shall be childless. And John looks at Herod and points his finger at him and says, You've taken your brother's wife. You stole her, and it should not be. And he got thrown in prison for it. And yet Herod liked John. There was something about John that he liked, and he kept going to see him, kept going to talk with him, kept going to hear what John had to say. But Herodias, his wife, didn't like him. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> she was a little upset that John would say, she shouldn't have married you, she shouldn't have left her husband. She was upset with him. So Herod threw him in jail. He sent forth, laid hold upon John, bound him in prison for Herodias' sake. For her sake, he did this because he told him that, that she shouldn't have done that, that he shouldn't have done that, that together they shouldn't have done that, coming against their desires, coming against their wants, coming against their thoughts, and, and she didn't like it. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she couldn't because Herod didn't want to kill him. So she devises a plan. She comes up with a deception, and it tells us in Scripture that in the last days, deception is going to get greater and greater. And do you see deception in the news today? Do you see deception in the world today? Do you see your political leaders just lying right to your face and people saying, oh, that's all right, you can lie to me. Deception, just coming over people and just allowing things that shouldn't be to be. She devises this plan. And it says in verse 24, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and he was holy. There was a holiness about him. And he, it says he observed him. He looked at him to see what this holiness was. A holy life will bring people to look at you. See if they can point fingers at you. Some look at it to see what it is about holiness that's right and true. And it says that he heard him and he did many things and he heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords and his high captains and his chief uh, estates or chief principal officers of Galilee. And, and when the daughter of Herodias... Um, and when the daughter of said Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and them that sat with him. And the king said to the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. And he sware to her, Whatsoever you shall ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Isn't that amazing? A king with no wisdom. <laughs> it tells us in Proverbs that kings should seek out wisdom and understanding. He's not seeking out anything but fleshly desires. He's sensually moved by her dance, by what she did. And so he says, whatever you want, I'll give to you. Up to half of my kingdom. Get serious. Mm. That's not wisdom at all. That's just foolishness on his part. And she went forth and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist, the head of the holy man. Do you see what she's doing? She's coming after somebody who's holy. And if you think you're immune from that, you're mistaken. There are people who want deception so bad that they will come against anything that's holy, whether it's you, whether it's the name of Jesus, 
whether it's a church body. Look at the things that happened to the churches. Uh, Mike McClure, pastor of a church in, in California. California came after him. They forgave everybody else. He stayed open during COVID and they find him and by they kept finding him. Every time he had a service, they find him some more. <laughs> and he was up to over $3 million that he owed California. And of course, his attorney sued and he, he just won the judgment that California had no right to sue him because they, they were keeping places open with hundreds of people in there, but they wouldn't let the church stay open with people in there. And praise the Lord for it, for people standing up like that to things that are right. A holy man, John, a holy man, and the world through Herodias is coming after him. And you know what? He flinched a little bit, didn't he? But he stayed in that place of being holy before God. And what is our calling? Are we to stand holy in the days that we're in? Or are we going to fold? And you know what? Without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, without you being in the Word, becoming your strength and your very sustenance, we're going to fold in the days that are coming ahead of us because the days are going to get worse for Christianity. The days are going to get worse for everybody, but especially for Christianity. Are we going to stand or are we going to fold? And our prayer for all of you, and my prayer for me is that I won't. Pray for me. Because <laughs> I'm allergic to pain, like Mark Randolph says. <laughs> I'm allergic to pain. I don't like it. I don't want to go through it. I'm not going to do it. <sighs> I don't like pain. But if God is working in me, then I won't have it. Remember Stephen, when he was standing before the council, and he gave him that whole dissertation and, and told him they were doing what was wrong, and they started stoning him? It said that he looked up above the stones that were coming at him, and he saw the glory of God. He saw heaven open, and he saw the glory of God. And he was able to take the punishment that was coming upon him for being right and holy. Those things may not happen to you and I, but what is going to happen to you and I? Peter, when he, was, when he came to Jesus' crucifixion and he was standing there and the little maid came up and she said, You're one of them Galileans, I know. And he folded because he had no strength. Why? Because he was walking afar off from Jesus. We need to stand close to Jesus because we'll have no strength otherwise. It's only through his strength it's, remember, at the start of this, when he sent them out, he said that he gave them power. And he wants to give you the same power to stand holy and righteous before the world that accuses us. <laughs> she comes in, Herodias' daughter, and she came in straightway. There's that word again uh, in Mark. With haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. <coughs> And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. He knew it was wrong. This isn't going to be the last time he knows things are wrong and yet he's going to do something wrong. But here it is here. It shows his character. It shows his nature that he knows something is wrong, but he's not going to do anything to correct it. And for you and I as Christians, we can't be so proud that when somebody tells us that something is wrong in our life, we can't sit there and say, I don't care. I'm not going to listen to you anymore because there's something wrong with you. We've got to be able to be broken enough to say, yes, there is something wrong with me and I need help. Because the Lord sometimes will show us things through people around us. I remember the first time I experienced that. I was in the back room at Wegmans and I was mad at something and I picked up a skid and I threw it across the room into the wall because I was so upset with what was going on. And one of the guys that, that worked for me was there and he just looked at me and the, the Lord sent him. I know it. <laughs> and I could have hurt him, but I couldn't. But he looked at me and he said, I didn't know Christians did that. It was just, oh, it just completely broke me down. I couldn't say anything because he was right. I shouldn't be doing that. But I let something get to me that the Lord was trying to show me was wrong in my life. And the anger rose up in my heart and I just reacted in the flesh instead of let, letting the spirit subdue that with, which was in me to do wrong. Oh, Lord, help. 
And we all have those things in our hearts. We're not perfect. If we were perfect, we wouldn't be here anymore. (laughs) We still have things that are going on that we need correcting. But the king wouldn't correct it. He didn't do anything about it. And immediately he sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison. And he brought his head in a charger and he gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. Can you imagine how sick must you be to have that happen and to carry it? your mother wow it's a sick world we think it's sick now it was just as sick then (laughs) and when his disciples heard of it they came and they took up the corpse and they laid it in a tomb and the apostles gathered themselves together unto jesus notice where they gathered they gathered to jesus when we come to church we don't gather to a church name we gather to jesus we're not here because it's calvary chapel we're here because it's jesus The apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest for a while, uh, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. He invites them to come, just like he invites you and I to come to him if we're heavy laden and burdened, and he'll give us rest. He invites us. He doesn't command us. He invites us. Jesus never commands us to do things. He invites us to do those things, to become part of his kingdom. He invites us to come in fellowship with him. He invites us to come and partake of the word and get built up and strengthened. He doesn't command us to do it. He invites us. And we go, am I going to accept the invitation today to come and spend time with Jesus? And when they had departed into a desert place by ship privately, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot uh, thither out of all the cities, and out went them, so they ran faster than they could row. Uh, And they came together unto him, and when in Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them, because they were sheep not having a shepherd. And remember, he's the good shepherd, and what does he do? He begins to teach them many things it tells us this in first peter 5 2 he tells peter feed the flock of god which is among you taking oversight thereof not by constraint not not forcing them but but do it willingly not for filthy lucre not for money but of a ready mind do it because your mind and your heart has told you that this is right and this is what you're supposed to do you feed the flock of god no matter how tired no matter how anxious, no matter how oppressive things have become in your life, you feed the flock that's around you. Husbands, you feed the flock of your family. Wives, you feed your kids. You feed your neighbors. You feed your co-workers the truth of the word. He invites them to come, and they come, and he sees all these people. They, They were like sheep. They didn't have a shepherd. Wait a second. They had churches all over. They had synagogues all over. But not one of them was a shepherd, is really what Jesus is saying. There wasn't a shepherd to minister to the people. They were looking for someone who would lead them, not drive them, not command them, but invite them. And Jesus invites you and I to come and just spend time with him. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desert place. You guys know this story, but here we are in this place. This is a desert place. Isn't it amazing that Jesus doesn't take them and and take the disciples after John was beheaded and take them to the Ritz-Carlton? He takes them to the desert. Here, sit down, guys. This is great, isn't it? Really? But isn't it cool that sometimes the Lord takes us to the desert? where there is absolutely nothing but him, because then he's got our attention. If you're at the Ritz, you got too many people running around. you got too many servants going through and doing things. You, you've got too much pleasure in front of you. You have the comedy club there. You have all the other clubs that are there serving alcohol. you got all the other things that are going on there, all the card games, all the events taking place. All the things that distract you. If you go to a desert place, there's nothing there but just Jesus. And he said, come and spend some time with me there at this desert place. And not only do they go, but all these people run and show up. (laughs) 
if you ha really have a love for the Lord, you're going to run to the things that God has for you. God, you're calling me to a desert place? Oh, great, let's go. And people look at you and go, you're sick. No, I'm the healthiest I've ever been because Jesus and I have got a relationship and I'm healthier now than I've ever been before. I'm healthier now than when I was doing drugs. I'm healthier now than when I was drinking. I'm healthier now than when I was out running around in clubs. I'm healthier now than I've ever been in my life because Jesus and I have a relationship. The world can't understand it because they've never experienced a relationship with God. They have a God, but it's not the true and the living God. And it doesn't matter if it's a desert place or the Ritz. You can enjoy Jesus in both places. But it just depends on where he's calling us to right now. Well, Lord, how come you're calling him to go to the Ritz and you're calling me to go to the desert? It's not fair. How come he's got a big church and we got a little church? It's not fair, God. He goes, I've called them to a bigger place. I've called you here. Mm. Be faithful where God is called and obey. And you'll have the best life that you could ever imagine. <laughs> the day was far spent. His disciples came to him and said, this is a desert place for now the time is far past. And so what do the disciples say? Send them away. Get rid of the jamokes. Come on, Lord. We got stuff to do. Remember, we came here for a retreat. And, and here we are ministering. What else are you going to do at a retreat? Send them away that they may go into the country round about into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And, and they say unto him, Shall we go forth and, and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? In verse 36, the disciples say, Send them away. In verse 37, Jesus says, Give everything up that you are to them right now. Oh, what a difference between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. We say, send them away. And the Lord says, give them more. But Lord, you've been teaching all day. What, what are we going to give them? We, we've got nothing. They came unprepared on purpose <laughs> because God had a different plan than they did. They're sitting there scratching their heads trying to figure out what are we going to give that we don't have. And he saith unto them, how many loaves do you have? He doesn't ask what we think. He asks, what do you have that you can give? I've got a relationship with Jesus that I can give to my family because they don't have any. I can give joy to my neighbor because they have none. They have problems and woes and no relationship with Jesus. And I've got joy I can give them. It's not always monetary, is it? But it's always worthwhile. How many loaves do you have? He knew the boy was in the crowd. And he knew what he had. How many loaves do you have? Go and see him. When they knew, they said, well, there's five loaves, little pita rolls, and two little fishes. And he commanded them uh, to make them all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And when they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties, order, God's order is coming to pass. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven, blessed and break the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before them and the, the fishes divided he among them all. The little that we have, if the Lord has blessed it and has broken us in the midst of it, he can give out to others. But if we're unwilling to be broken by God, then there's no blessing upon it and we can't give out anything. For God to work with the little that we have, he needs to be the one to bless it. We need to be allowed and open to him breaking us. And then he can give us. Because it takes brokenness in our part to minister to somebody else, don't, isn't it? When you have to give up something of yourself, it's got to be a blessing from the Lord. We need to be broken. And then we can give. Can't give till it's broken. Mm. Isn't that encouraging? You're going to go out and get broken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe not that exciting, but hey, you know what's exciting about it? Because you're going to see God work in a way that you never saw him work before. And it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. And they all did eat. If God hadn't have blessed it and then broken it, they never would have eaten all that was eaten. Lord, you mean I, I've got to get broken before I can give out to my neighbor, my kids, my family? 
Yeah, because it takes a humbling to say, I'm under submission to God. And because I'm under him, I need to be broken so that he can increase. Mm. When that happens, then God can provide and give to all those that are around us. And they did eat of the loaves, and there were about 5,000 men. Not counting the women and the children, you can do the math, you can come up with it. But there's at least 5,000 eating five little pita rolls, two little sardines, and God breaks it and multiplies it. What do you have that's little that you think God will never use? If he blesses it and he breaks it, he can give to all those that are around you if you allow him to work. What a great thing to see God do. What a great thing to have God do if we allow him to do it. <laughs> Let's, uh, we'll stop there and we'll, uh, we'll pray and then we'll uh, see if there's any prayer requests tonight. We'll go from there. If you need to use the restrooms or get a drink of water or something, go ahead. Or if you need to leave, uh, if I've offended you, <laughs> I, you won't be the first and you probably won't be the last, not because I want to, but just because that's what happens. Uh, but let's pray. Father, just thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, may truly, Lord, uh, your word sink deep, deep, deeply into our hearts and our lives that we would allow you to work, Lord. Uh, there's just something that goes on when you bless and you break us that, that we can be given out to those around us when we don't have the strength, when we don't have the energy, when we don't even have the vision for it, that, that when you start working, things happen. And Lord, wherever you went, things happened. And Father, we want that same thing to be in our lives too, Lord. So often we go and nothing ever happens or we think nothing ever happens. But Lord, uh, we, we, we just want to see those things, those spiritual events take place in our lives, Lord. That when you bless and we're broken, you give. Father, we ask for your anointing. We ask for your working and we ask, Lord, for you to show our hearts and our lives what it is that you want to do and why it is some things have never taken place, Lord. Uh, be with us and just show us these things. And we just thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.